appreciate that. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at a wonderful passage of Scripture today about Jesus, uh, some things that Jesus uh, said, some things He actually read uh, uh, in, in a worship setting such as this. Uh, while you're turning uh, there, uh, let me uh, remind you that Easter is soon. Easter is a month of Sundays away, is that right? Uh, four Sundays from today will be Easter Sunday. And um, we are always excited about uh, the opportunities for worship that, uh, that are here uh, during the Easter season. Uh, just to kind of walk through it, you'll probably hear us walk through it uh, more than once between now and then. Um, Wednesday night before Easter, we always have a really special intimate service here in the worship center. Uh, we always uh, partake of the Lord's Supper on that Wednesday night before Easter. Uh, this year, we as a staff have felt led to just kind of pursue a service, service that really is focused on Scripture being read uh, and uh, the folks who come praying uh, and then some songs uh, as well. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful time of worship. Uh, I encourage you to come uh, to that. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we, we kind of have a progression of events that happen. We have our sunrise service. S-O-N rise, because we know the sun probably rises at a different time, but S-O-N rise service at 7 a.m. Uh, weather permitting, it'll be back here in this back parking lot. Uh, and then we have a breakfast following that. And then we have our Bible study, which I think this year the kids are also doing their uh, children's worship and Easter egg hunt during that 915 Bible study hour. Uh, and then, of course, we have our morning worship service at 1030. So it's not too early to be inviting friends and encouraging those that you know uh, to, uh, to come with you uh, uh, Easter week, Easter Sunday. Uh, I really believe this is true. You've got a lot of friends, maybe friends who don't go to church, who might be inclined to go to church on an Easter Sunday if they just received an invitation. Sometimes that's all it takes. And uh, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, this year. Think about who, be praying about them right now, who you will invite uh, to worship here uh, during the Easter uh, week activities. Well, let's look at God's Word together. Uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. And again, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be together hearing your word and uh, deeply considering the meaning of it for our lives. Lord, we confess our need for you right now. I need you because I can't preach these words without your power. I have nothing in my own to give. Father, I think about those who are here this morning, and um, I know that there may be people here this morning who are seeking you, and maybe for the first time in their lives, maybe there are people here who've lived a life of, of following Christ, and others who maybe have yet to trust Christ. We all kind of fit somewhere along that spectrum, but, but Lord, help us to hear from you today. There's a song that says, all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. That's really what the case is, Lord. Unless you move and work in our hearts, we're just here going through the motions. So we just want to stop right now and ask you to do what you want to do, whatever that is. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, springtime has come to Pecan Grove. Raise your hand if you're happy about that. Yeah, now, now some of you raise your hand, big old smile on your face, but your car looks kind of yellow, right? And you, you sleep with Kleenex by your bed and, and because of the allergies and everything. So, but, but yes, we're all kind of excited, I think, that, that springtime is, is here. And with it comes those smells that are associated with the season. I, I've started to smell some of these even this week. Uh, some of you may be smelling uh, fresh cut grass. Uh, it just seems like this time of year, everybody's grass is getting cut or they're cutting the grass. And so you start smelling that smell even more intensely than maybe we have in the last few, few months. Uh, maybe some of you are smelling floral smells. You know, maybe uh, jasmine or honeysuckle. I was standing on the front of the chapel with Barry Yates uh, waiting for folks to show up so we could go eat at the new barbecue restaurant. And, and um, I was like, what's that smell? Is that, is that jasmine? And I'm not sure if I ever decided whether or not it was the soap that Barry had just used for his shower or, or whether or not there was some jasmine coming from, from somewhere uh, and it had just kind of made its way uh, this, this way. Uh, and of course, my favorite new smell is from the Hickory Barn barbecue. That smells in the air right now across the street. Uh, but when you, when you smell something familiar, you, you know where it comes from or what it comes from. Barbecue comes from a smokehouse, right? You smell that smell, you know that somewhere somebody's burning wood and they got brisket, you know, smoking somewhere. Uh, jasmine or honeysuckle comes from a vine. And cut grass comes from cut grass. You know, it's just, just the smell of grass having been cut. And in a very real sense, and I want us to think about this this morning, in a very real sense, there is a fragrance of Jesus. Now that may sound a little bit weird, but there is a fragrance of Jesus. And when you, uh, figuratively speaking, when you smell it, you know it comes from Jesus. And for today, as we continue our walk through these fair questions that people outside the Christian faith may be asking about Christianity, today we're exploring a question that many people have. And it's a bothersome question. And when I say it's bothersome, I don't mean so much because it makes us angry at the person who asks it, but maybe it's bothersome more so because it causes us to look at ourselves as Christians, as Christ followers, as the church, and see some unpleasant things. So here's... Here's the question. Why is the church responsible for so much injustice? Now, uh, as we go through uh, our home groups or, or going through our discussion time with uh, the book from Timothy Keller, The Reason for God, in The Reason for God, uh, Timothy Keller quotes a, a lady by the name of Jessica, who he identifies as a law student who provides uh, another way of asking this question. Jessica says this, the church has a history of supporting injustice, of destroying culture. If Christianity is the true religion, how could this be? Now, before we just respond to Jessica's question, or these questions that people outside the Christian faith may be asking, and before the hair on our necks begins to stand up as we get defensive, <laughs> let's just be honest for a moment or two. Those who ask these kinds of questions are right about something. There have been some terrible things done by those who are identified as followers of Jesus Christ. We just can't escape that. Christians have been involved in acts and have been involved in periods of injustice in this world. So we have to start today with a clear understanding of this. 
And, and here are just a few notable cases where this has happened, or in some cases maybe is still happening. And I know this is going to be unpleasant even to think about, but these are cases when this has happened. You take the Crusades. When the, the uh, European uh, Anglo Christians went down to the Holy Land, and, and they didn't go down to the Holy Land because they wanted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the Muslims or the infidels, as they would have called them. They went down to the Holy Land because the Muslims had control of Jerusalem and they wanted it back. It was an honor thing, right? For the honor of, of Christianity, we've got to regain the Holy Land. Okay? And then what about the pro-slavery preaching in, in North America in the, in the uh, Civil War times, before the Civil War times? I wasn't around then, but I can promise you this. People who had my job were basically standing in pulpits and using this book to justify slavery. Now, the problem is, is they had a complete misunderstanding of, of, of even when in the Bible when slavery presented, it's not the kind of slavery that existed in North America in the 19th century. I mean, that was human trafficking. <laughs> that was lifelong enslavement where people were, were, were stolen from their country and brought to North America and separated from their families for a lifetime. How do you support that from the Bible? <laughs> But it was happening. It was happening. And what about the German church during the Holocaust? Now, if you know your history and if you know your, your church history during that time, you understand and know that there were those in the German church, uh, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you're aware of who that is, who resisted the Nazis and who called themselves the confessing church. In other words, they considered themselves to be the true church, while the state church, the, 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 the Lutheran church, the church in Germany, in many ways was just a puppet of the Nazis, and in some cases looking the other way while the Holocaust was happening, and certainly not preaching against it. But we can't escape the fact that people who were called, whether they were true believers or not, people who were called by the name of Christ were enabling the Holocaust. And, and what about Southern churches during the Civil Rights Movement? Here we go. We come back to our neck of the woods. Southern churches during the Civil Rights Movement. When, when George Wallace in my state in Alabama stood in front of uh, the, the, the doors of, of, of one of the buildings in the University of Alabama resisting African American students being, being segregated into um, um, or integrated into schools. And when George Wallace stood at the Capitol steps and said, segregation now, segregation uh, today, segregation whatever, I'm butchering it. Basically, segregation forever. He made a stand. There were, there were Baptist preachers. There were Christian preachers who were basically supporting it from the Bible and, and saying, yes, the people from the north are trying to come and steal our way of life. Let's stand up against them. Some of you were alive then. <laughs> Maybe you can understand a little bit of what was going on. And then, even now, it's not just now, it's been going on beyond, you know, for years, I'm sure, but now we're hearing a lot of, of indications of, of instances of sexual abuse in, in the church. Now, of course, the, the Catholics have all the attention here, right? And the Pope and what the Pope did. But you know that it's not only happening in the Catholic church, right? It's happening in Baptist churches. It's happening in Christian churches. Christian leaders, sexual abuse is a reality. People who are called by the name of, the Christ, of Christ are doing these things. And the world's noticing. The world's noticing. We can't deny the church's direct or indirect involvement in these things. It's not fake news. These things have happened or are happening. In these instances and other instances like them, some may be very public, some only a few may know about, they pose a problem for us as believers and for those who are outside the Christian faith as well. I mean, how do we sort all of this out? 
How do we sort this out? How do we reconcile the reality of who Jesus Christ is, what Jesus Christ taught, and the bad behavior of those who claim to follow Him? How do we sort it all out? Well, we're going to try to address this some uh, this morning. How do we sort out the problem of, of Christians behaving uh, unjustly. Well, let's start here. This is a very important place to start. Don't blame Jesus for the bad things done in His name. I've been walking with Christ for years. I've been a believer in Jesus Christ for years. And you know what? I've done some bad things. Not one time do I bl blame Jesus for any of the bad things I've done. <laughs> you know who gets blamed for that? This guy. <laughs> Not even the devil. <laughs> this guy. Don't blame Jesus for the bad things done in his name. Often when people who are identified as Christians do terrible things, the response of some, both inside the church and outside the church, is to walk away from Jesus or to dismiss Jesus. It's as if they're blaming Jesus for, for, for those things happening. Uh, moral failings of, of church leaders. Christians who are overbearing and attempting to control other people. Christians who are self-righteous and judging others uh, from a self-righteous perspective. And, and all those things that we've, we've already considered could be times when, when people who have been a part of a Christian church may say, forget this, I'm out of here. Raise your hand if you know somebody who's left church because of something like that. A few. Yeah, there are a lot of folks who, who say, That's, I'm not going to be a part of church. Too many hypocrites there. They say one thing, do another. I'm out of here. Or what about those outside the church? For them, it just gives them more ways to add uh, to their argument. It, more, more reasons why to them Christianity is, is just made up of of hypocritical people, and if that is who they are, then the Jesus they talk about can't be real or can't be worth my time. So those outside the Christian faith see this as a reason to not even pursue Christ or even see any validity in Christ. But consider this, and this is so important, these problems and all of those really big historical ones are not instances when Christians were following Christ too closely. <laughs> the problem here isn't that Christians are following Christ so closely that they're doing these things. That's not the problem. Uh, these are cases when these people were not following Christ as they should be following Christ. That's what's really going on here. Jesus didn't teach these things. And the problem is not being too Christian. The problem is not being Christian enough. That's why these things have happened. What is the fragrance of Jesus? Well, I'll tell you what the fragrance of Jesus is not. The fragrance of Jesus is not racism. The fragrance of Jesus is not oppression of the poor and the needy. The fragrance of Jesus is not abortion. The fragrance of Jesus is not religious wars. The fragrance of Jesus is not greed. The fragrance of Jesus is not lust for power and control over other people. The fragrance of Jesus is not hatred of people of other faiths. The fragrance of Jesus is not sexual abuse. None of those things are the true fragrance of Jesus. These things, when you smell them, <laughs> you're not smelling Jesus. Jesus is not where these things are coming from. Hear this. It is right to expect Christians to live like Christ. But it is wrong to disbelieve Him when they don't. Absolutely, it is right to expect Christians to live like Jesus and to be surprised when Christians live or do bad things. But it is wrong to disbelieve Jesus when those who are called his followers don't live this way. 
And anyone who does not believe in Jesus will answer to him, not to those who follow him. There's not one instance when an unbeliever is going to stand before a Christian who behaved badly in this world in the final estimation and be able to look at that Christian and say, I guess I'm okay for the afterlife because I saw how you lived. That's not who they're going to be standing in front of. What does Scripture tell us? Scripture tells us this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Christians who behave badly are going to stand, are going to answer to God for the way they have behaved. But unbelievers, even those who chose not to believe because they saw Christians behaving badly, will also stand before Jesus Christ. And imagine standing before Jesus and saying this, I would have followed you, Jesus, or in some cases, I would have kept following you. But Christians did so many bad things and they were fake and they were hypocritical so I'm sure, Jesus, you can understand I chose not to. Now, I want you to think about this. Some of you are parents. All of you have been children of parents, right? <laughs> so one way or the other, you're going to be able to relate to this. Imagine this. Imagine a child is talking to his, and I'm going to throw the guys under the bus, not the girls, but girls can do this too. Suppose a guy, is, a son is talking to his mom and dad, and this is what the son says to mom and dad at 12.30 a.m. in their bedroom one night. Mom and dad, I know you told me not to drive the car. And I know I snuck out with my friends after curfew in it. And I know that I wrecked it, but it wasn't my fault. There was a squirrel in the road. And I swerved to miss the squirrel and I hit a tree. So you see, it's not my fault, it's the squirrel's fault. Parents, does that fly with you if your child uses that as an argument? It better not. If it does, you're an enabler. <laughs> Guys, did it fly with you when you said something like that to your mom? Did it work for you when you said something like that to your mom and dad? Of course not. And why would we think it any less silly to stand before a holy God, before the Lord of the universe and said, not following you isn't my fault. It's the fault of those who were following you. Or maybe, Jesus, it's your fault since they were your people. That's not going to work. And we as Christians have to answer to, the th answer to Christ for the things that we do. But if you're a non-believer and you're not following Christ because of the bad things that Christians do or whatever reason... You have to understand, they're not the ones you're going to stand before in the final estimation things. You're going to stand before Jesus. He's going to be the one you're going to answer to. Don't blame Jesus for the bad things done in his name. Here's another way to sort out the problems of Christians behaving unjustly. Think about this. Don't ignore how his people have been agents of positive change. We have to admit that Christians, uh, those claiming to follow Christ, have behaved badly. But when it comes to our discussion today, we, we, we constantly run the risk of burying the lead. 
That's what this question that we're talking about today is doing. It is burying the lead. What gets all the attention is the behavior of groups of Christians or individual Christians who stand out as being hypocritical or stand out as causing injustice. But the lead is to acknowledge how Christ has worked through His true followers to accomplish amazing things. All in keeping with His kingdom work and all consistent with our Scripture today. What did Jesus say? Jesus took the scroll and He read these words from the, the prophet Isaiah. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These things that, that Christ reads from the scroll here marked His earthly ministry. And again, this is prophecy from Isaiah about the work, from Isaiah's perspective, the future work of the Messiah, the Anointed One. So I want you to capture this moment in your heart and mind for just a minute. This is Nazareth. This is Jesus' hometown. Jesus grew up in this synagogue, okay? There are kids who've grown up in this church, so it's easy to kind of imagine that, right? Jesus grew up in this synagogue. As was the custom, rabbis or, 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 or religious leaders would be sometimes asked to read from the scroll and then say a few words about it. So that's what's happening here. Jesus takes what may have just simply been that day's reading from the prophet Isaiah, and he reads it. Every eye is fixed on him while he reads that. So I want you to imagine that. Jesus reads these words and he stops and everybody's just leaning in. And then Jesus says, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm the guy that these words are talking about. And then he does this. <laughs> Mic drop. This was Jesus' mic drop moment, if, you know, if you're savvy enough to know what all that's about. What an amazing moment. But here's the problem. It was his hometown. We didn't read it, but the response of the people was, as you can imagine, not so great when Jesus basically claimed to be the Messiah in front of the people he had grown up with. Now, we know this about Jesus. He was sinless. So, I don't think any of us in this room can imagine what a sinless child would have been like, right? So, Jesus was sinless, and he demonstrated that way of living in front of the people, but they could not accept the fact that the Messiah would be somebody who grew up with them, right? And so, they rejected Christ as the Messiah in that moment. But, folks, that is exactly what Jesus was doing. He went home and told them, I'm the guy. I'm the one. This is an amazing moment. But what he was also doing is he was identifying his ministry with the ministry that Isaiah presents here. Again, the things that the prophet Isaiah is talking about, the ministry of, of, of the Messiah, the things that Jesus read and, and associated with himself at that moment, that's the fragrance of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm he. And his life and his ministry backed it up. And Jesus is still working. He hasn't stopped. He's still working through his people to accomplish these things mentioned here in, 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 in our reading today and many more. And when these things are evident, that's Jesus. And here are just a, a, a few ways that Jesus has used his followers through the years, in some cases, to reverse the bad things that were done in his name by those who were false followers or those who were not following him to, 
closely enough. So here are some things that his followers have done. And some of these directly speak to the things we've already looked at. The abolition movement. Okay, there were pastors like myself in the South. I'm not one of them, but I'm saying there were people who had my job in the South who were preaching that slavery was, was, was justified by the Bible and they were promoting the, the continuation of it. Well, in the North, there are strong believers who were saying slavery is wrong. The entire abolition movement leading up to the time when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, they were the ones putting the pressure on him to do it, was led by Christians was led by Christ followers. How about the civil rights leaders? Were the key leaders in the civil rights movement white politicians from the North? No, they were African-American Christians. Martin Luther King Jr. was a Christian pastor. What did he do when he preached, uh, when he preached in front of masses of people? Did he appeal to the United States Constitution as the reason why Southern uh, people should stop uh, oppressing uh, blacks? No, he appealed to the Bible. He appealed to the prophets. He said, because this isn't the way it should be according to what the Bible has to say. Listen, how about pro-life champions? Now listen, I am not in favor of all the methods that have been used through the years to oppose abortion. And quite frankly, this is another one of those cases where there are some bad things that have been done in Christ's name. Bombing abortion clinics or, or, or doing awful things towards people, people like that, that's just stupid. It's unbelievably stupid and, and it causes more damage to, to what is a, an important cause than it does good. But the leaders of the pro-life movement in America are Christians. And there are blind spots on the part of those who have the same arguments we're talking of against Christianity today that they don't see this as a human rights issue. They don't see that the right to life of the unborn is important. And Christians are the ones that are standing up and saying that child inside the mom is a living human being created by God. They get that from the Bible. And to end or terminate that pregnancy shouldn't be merely a case of whether or not the woman has a wife right to choose or not. It should be based on the fact that that is a human life inside of her. Christians are leading that. Sometimes they mess up and do stupid things in the cause. But Christians are leading that. And then think about this. Think about major Christian contributions to, to what really are some of the most positive aspects of our society. Think about Christian contributions to health. Have you been to a hospital named Methodist Hospital lately? Or maybe you've been in a place where there was a hospital called Baptist Hospital or here one's called St. Luke's. Guess where that started? <laughs> Christians started those hospitals and have contributed to, to health and, and, and the medical well-being of society for years. What about poverty relief? We can talk about some big names out there, but how about just our local friends attack poverty and all that they do right now? Christians are doing that. Gender equality. We're in the middle of a season where all of that's being talked about. Do you realize that any society where, where Christianity is, is, has, been, has been majorly influential, women have more rights than societies where that's not the case? Christ himself was the greatest liberator of women known to man. We have some things to sort out there because, again, in the name of Christ, there have been some stupid things done and said. But gender equality itself is something that Christ himself demonstrated. Orphan care and adoption. Sam and Elizabeth George, for those of you who know them, in India. Their whole life has been taking care of the unwanted, the undesirables in India. People that basically had children who had no hope. If Sam, unless Sam and Elizabeth had stepped in and taken them in and cared for them and raised them as their own children. It's just one case of countless number of cases where Christians following Christ have cared for the orphans. And some in this room have adopted children yourselves. Education. Christians' contribution to education is so important. Some of our most visible universities, for example, started as Christian institutions. Now, some of them have gone way off the, <laughs> way off the plantation where that's concerned. <laughs> but still, Christians saw the need 
and the benefit to society to help people be educated. And Christians led this movement. Disaster relief right now, probably in Nebraska and other places, there were, there were white haired men and women in, in, in yellow vests that say Southern Baptist Disaster Relief on it that are feeding people and are helping people cover from disasters. Many of our disaster relief organizations have Christian beginnings, if not Christian, uh, or, or not, if, if they're not currently being led by Christians. Peacemaking, Christians have led, led the, the movement all over the world for, for true peace. Not the absence of conflict, not, not pacification, but true peace. Christians have been involved in this. And, and then what about this guy? Mr. Rogers, a Presbyterian minister. That's all I got to say about that, right? Listen, Christians have been involved in some of the most important contributions to society. And this isn't me trying to champion Christians or get people to vote for Christians or any of a number of things. But the point is, is that Jesus has been working through his true followers doing these things. This is the lead. And we bury the lead by looking at the bad instances. This is the lead. This has been going on for 2,000 years since Christ ascended to be with the Father. Christians have been following Christ's teachings and Christ himself has been accomplishing what he said here in our passage in Luke through his people for centuries. And of course, what I have just done is to interpret all of what Jesus has said from a physical standpoint, right? Right? As, as a evidence of his kingdom work, the fragrance of Jesus on this earth is from a physical standpoint, the things that Jesus talks about happening. But don't miss the spiritual application of Christ's kingdom. Because if you only see the physical, you stop short of the dramatic scope of what Christ is doing. While Christ is doing these things through his followers, the real way that Christ is working is inside of people. Jesus is changing hearts. He is changing lives. And, and his kingdom means that his reign has come inside the heart of a human being. His reign and rule in the hearts of people. So think about it this way. The poor, the poor are those who realize their need for him. All of us, all of us, all of us before Jesus are poor, spiritually speaking. We have nothing in ourselves worth that, that, that could accomplish our own salvation. The poor are those who realize their need for Jesus. The captives are those who are enslaved to sin and to self. The blind are those who are living in darkness and who have not been able to see the truth, but now can through Christ. The oppressed are those who have been ruled by Satan and the things of this world. And Jesus has set them free from that. And what about the year of the Lord's favor? He ends it right there, right? The, the, talking about the year of the Lord's favor. That brings us to the next way to sort out the problem of Christians behaving unjustly. It's this, don't forget grace. Jesus said this, or read this from the prophet Isaiah, that the role of the Messiah, his role, Jesus' role is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The word favor is closely connected to the word grace. Grace is actually God's unmerited and undeserved favor. Grace is not something you earn. Grace is not something you deserve. Grace is something given to you even though you don't earn it, even though you don't deserve it. And everyone, everyone, everyone alive on this planet is experiencing God's grace right now. Now what I mean by that is common grace, okay? Everybody, everybody right now is receiving things from God they don't deserve. You know, think about it. Everybody's breathing air that God provided. Everybody's enjoying the warmth of the sunshine that God created, so forth and so on. 
Everybody is a recipient of God's common grace. Whether they believe in Him or not, they're recipients of His grace. And saving grace means the grace that we receive from Him leading to our salvation, meaning the way that we have a relationship with Him, the way that we have our sins forgiven, the way that we're able to live with Him for eternity. And again, that grace is unmerited. It's undeserved. Jesus is saying here that He is proclaiming the time of the Lord's favor. Folks, we are in that time right now. It's as if Jesus was saying, it starts now. And folks, it has yet to stop. It's still going on. So what is the time of the Lord's favor? It's that window of opportunity that exists for people to receive His saving grace before they die or before the Lord Jesus returns. And when the Lord Jesus returns, He's going to come to judge the world. We are now at this very moment in what has been a 2,000 year of the Lord's favor. <laughs> and will continue into the day you die for you or the day the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So I want you to hear this. The message of the gospel is that in this fallen world, God's grace, not our goodness, is our only hope. If you think it's all about our goodness, then the fact that Christians are behaving badly should drive you up the wall. But it's not based on our goodness. It's based on His grace. His grace is our only hope. The message of the Bible is people who follow God are going to do bad things. Have you read about King David, <laughs> for example? Adultery, murder, just a little snapshot. He was the king of the people of Israel, the one anointed by God to lead the people of Israel, the, the one who the, through his line the Messiah would come. He did some terrible things. David's salvation didn't depend on whether or not he didn't do bad things or whether or not he did all the good things. His salvation depended on grace. Receiving what he didn't deserve. Receiving what he hadn't earned. Listen, we cannot excuse away bad behavior on the part of Christians. Because the reality is we should live better than that. We should be better than that. We should know better. We, we are guided by the, the words of the Bible. We should expect Christians to follow Christ and be like him. And, and sometimes they're not. But the reality is, we're never promised that those who follow Him are always going to do the right thing. There are going to be times where they do the wrong thing. And, by the way, there are going to be times where people who are doing the wrong thing aren't really His true followers also. So if this is something that bothers you, or, or maybe somebody you know, understand this. The fragrance of Jesus is grace. It's grace. Now, what does that mean? It means we as Christ followers are the greatest examples of, the, of being recipients of that grace. But it also means, this is where we need to talk to ourselves, we need to be the ones who demonstrate this grace. When Christ followers live like Christ, the smell is grace. That's the fragrance of Jesus. Don't forget it. Listen, this is a fallen, messed up world. It always has been since the very beginning when Adam and Eve, who we can't blame, by the way, <laughs> rebelled against God because all of us have rebelled ourselves. It's a messed up, fallen, fallen world. And if you don't understand that, it's hard to understand other things. It's certainly under, hard to understand this question today. Because it's a messed up, fallen world, even people who are following God still sin. They still do things that are wrong. 
Of course there are hypocrites in the church. The worst part of being a hypocrite is not being a person who uh, does what you're not supposed to do. It's living as though you're perfect when you're not. (laughs) That's the worst part of being a hypocrite. It's like you're, you're wearing a mask. You're pretending to be, it's a role play, right? You're pretending to be somebody you're not. That's the worst part of being a hypocrite. But Jesus doesn't get the blame for that. Because that person isn't living the way Jesus has taught us to live. That person hasn't truly given their whole heart to Christ. They're still holding some things back. They're, they're not following him closely. There are a lot of reasons I can't get in the mind of all of us where that's concerned, but that's the reality. Listen, if you're a person today who, who these things are problematic for you, either you're in the church or out of the church, my, my encouragement to you is, one, don't leave the church. Don't leave. That's not the answer. Leaving the church is not the answer. Now, maybe there are some churches you need to leave for certain reasons, but I'm talking about just leaving the body of Christ is not the answer to say, okay, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm just going to be a Christian, and I'm going to live my faith alone. You'll never pull that off. You'll never pull that off. You need other believers, even flawed, messed up believers, to help you along the way. Don't leave the church. If you're outside the church looking in and this is keeping you away, then my encouragement to you is think in terms of one person. His name is Jesus Christ. And first and foremost, he is the one. He is the one you need. Not a church member, but he. I'm a pastor. I can't save you. (laughs) He can. I'm I'm, I'm a human being. I'm going to disappoint you. He won't. Follow him. Follow him. Seek him. Have the guts to open up this book and say, if you're real, God, show me. And he will. And if that's the case, you can have the kind of faith that is strong even when other Christians around you are blowing it. Because your faith is not depending on them. It's depending on